I want to read something to you. Obadiah. All right. You haven't read from there. Now you're wondering, is that in the Bible? The book of Obadiah. I'm serious, it's in the Bible. Come on. <laughs> you can turn to the table of contents. I can hear the pages of your Bible now. <laughs> Are you there yet? Yes. If you're not there, let me see your hand. If you're not there, let me see your hand. I said turn to the table of contents. That will make it easier for you. Mine is on page 1125. <laughs> Are you there? Yes. Thank you. I want you all to read verse 17. Again, one more time. Read it again. All right, read verse 18. How many of you understood it? Raise your hand if you understood it. If you didn't understand it, raise your hand. If you read it, raise your hand. If you heard it, raise your hand. If you didn't hear it, you didn't read it, so you don't understand it, raise your hand. Yeah, some didn't read it. You can't find it in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. All right? Okay, praise the Lord. I'm going to read it to you, and I want you to follow it. Verse 17, the book of Obadiah. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. Now I want you to notice, he didn't say upon Mount Zion shall they call for deliverance. I want you to observe. What does it say? shall be deliverance amen. amen and there shall be holiness it doesn't say they shall cry out for holiness it says there shall be holiness on mount zion and the house of jacob shall possess their possessions he didn't say they shall beg for their possessions but they shall possess their possessions. Amen. Now, that's not new to many of you. Some of you didn't quite know where it was in the Bible, but you've heard it all your life. But the next verse is very powerful. That's the 18th verse. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire. Say fire. Fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. Now, Joseph is from Jacob. You get it? So he's, the, he's in the same house of Jacob. Praise God. Yeah, the fire gives the flame. Amen. But then he says, And the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them, and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. 
He's telling us the house of Jacob will consume the house of Esau. Do you remember those two boys? Esau and Jacob. The sons of Isaac. Who was the son of Abraham? And you remember that Esau was older than Jacob. Remember that? He was the firstborn. But then he sold his birthright for food. And Jacob got the rights of the firstborn. Jacob became the heir of the Abrahamic covenant. What was the problem of Esau? The Bible says that Esau was profane. In other words, he treated sacred things lightly. He treated sacred things, spiritual things, lightly. And he lost the rights of the firstborn. And he lost his blessings. Hallelujah. Jacob, on the other hand, took spiritual things seriously. He took sacred things seriously. The rights of the firstborn meant something to him. Secondly, the blessing of his father meant something to him. Because he knew his father had the Abrahamic covenant. He had heard about it. He had heard of the promises. He believed in the Abrahamic covenant. And he became the heir of that covenant. These were two boys, one representing the spiritual house of God. And the other representing the house of profanity. That will not take spiritual things seriously. But they are from the same father. In other words, they stand for two groups in the church of God. Two houses in the church of God. One goes after the spirit. The other one goes after the flesh. But the Bible says that the children of the flesh are not the children of God. Are you hearing me? Right from the book of Genesis, you have these teachings, these teachings of the Spirit, letting us know that throughout the generation or the generations of the church, you would find these two houses. He's not even talking about the unconverted. He's not talking about the sinner. He's talking about those in the house. First, he lets us know about Cain and Abel. Sounds of the same parents. Then we move on and we find Ishmael and Isaac. Both of them being sons of Abraham. And as the Bible says, one was born according to the flesh that means according to natural laws natural biological laws nothing was wrong with that but the other one was born by promise that means according to the word of God when it was impossible naturally impossible for him to have been born but because the word said he would be born he was born Praise God. And so the Bible tells us, as you start in the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, he tells us, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And at both a contrary, one to the other. In Romans, the ninth, the eighth chapter, 
he also gives us the same teaching. And we're going to look at that in a moment. But here in the book of Abadah, that we read in the 18th verse, and he says, the house of Jacob shall be a fire. Now that lets us know the victory of the spiritual house of Israel. Can you say amen? amen. Even when you start in the book of Romans, the second chapter, the end of that chapter, you find Paul telling us that not everybody that's from Israel is of Israel. Praise God. He tells us there are two houses over there. One is spiritual, the other one is carnal. The spiritual will always triumph. He says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. He says, cast out the children of the flesh, because they will not be heir or heirs with the children of the spirit. What's he talking about? What's he referring to? When you come to Christ and you receive eternal life, you receive the light of God and you become a light in the world. He expects you to walk according to the Spirit. He expects you to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. What do you mean flesh? Your senses. The five senses in the body. You walk according to the Spirit. How do you walk according to the Spirit? The Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God gives you light. Amen. Now you know there are different kinds of lights. And the colors that we see depend on the light that's falling on them. When you change the color of the light, the color that you see will be different. Praise the Lord. I mean some of you understand physics. You know that the color that you see, this color, is not necessarily the color of what I'm wearing. But that the color that you see is the color that you get when all the others are absorbed. This is the one that you see under the light that we're using. If we change the light, it's a different color that you're going to see. So it depends on the light that you're using. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. It depends on the light that you're using. They're all the same. When you use the x-rays, you can see right into the human body. Is that correct? You see right in. That one doesn't care about your skin. It goes beyond your skin. This other one will stop on your clothes. Different kinds of lights will show you different things. If we were, if we were to live our lives under the x-rays, I don't know how many of us are going to be so beautiful. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Things will be different. Now, the Bible tells us the Word of God is light. And then it says the Word of God is the true light. Come on, say that with me. The Word of God is the true light. Say it again. The Word of God is the true light. One more time. See, because there are different kinds of lights. But the Word of God is the true light. Which means God wants us to see things under the light of his word. 
Amen. Praise God. That's walking in the Spirit. You look at things with the light of God. Under a different light, things will be different. When a doctor checks your body, for example, and gives you a report, it's based on the light that he's using. <laughs> Praise God. It's up to you. I said, it's up to you to walk with him in his light or to walk with God in his light. But he already tells us in, in his word that his word is the true light, which means every other light is false. That's why Isaiah the prophet says, Who hath believed our report? We got another report. Amen. The true light. Say it one more time. The true light. The, true light. the word of God is the 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 true light. You know, in Second Corinthians, the third chapter, the 18th verse, he says, as we look at the glory of God in a mirror. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As we look at the glory of God in a mirror. As we look. As we look at the glory of God in a mirror. As we look, how many of you use the mirror today? Did you use a mirror today? Yeah. Come on, talk to me now. If you didn't, then maybe we'll have to check you again. Come on. Did you use a mirror today? Yeah. Did you like what you saw? Yeah. Come on. How many of you, when you looked into that mirror, you saw me? You didn't see your face, you saw me. All right, if you looked at the mirror and you saw yourself and you were surprised that you saw yourself, can I see your hand up? All right, now, if you used the mirror today and you saw yourself and you knew it was perfectly normal for you to see yourself, can I see your hand up? Thank you. So you know what a mirror is. Praise God. <laughs> now he says, as we look, as we behold, as we look steadfastly into the mirror of God, he says, we are metamorphosed. We are changed. We are transfigured. That's another word. Into the same image that we behold in that mirror. He says, as we look, we are changed. As we look, we are changed. As we behold the glory of God. Now, this is, this is awesome. When it says, as we behold the glory of God in a mirror. Listen. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. He says, as we look at the glory of God in a mirror. How could I look at the glory of God in a mirror? That's not possible. Because when I look at the mirror, I can't see anything but me. Hey, come on here. Did you get that? Yes. When I look at a mirror, I can't see anything else but me. Now he says, as we look at the glory of God in a mirror, what is God telling you? That when you look at a mirror, you see yourself. Now he tells you, that that one that you see is called the glory of God. So I am the glory of God. 
No wonder the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the express image of the Father's person. He's the effulgence of His glory. He reveals the glory of God. Jesus Christ is the very glory of God. Hallelujah. But you know what? He's gone home to be with the Father. And I am here now. I'm his representative. You are his representative. He says, you are the glory of God. Well, when you look at you, you say, but I don't look like what I see in the mirror. The mirror is the word of God. For example, when you look in this mirror, this is the mirror of God. Hallelujah. He says, you are a new creation. But I don't look like a new creation. I look like what I've always known. But he says, uh-uh. You are a new creation. So I see me in the mirror of God. Well, I think I'm a weak man. I can do nothing. But he says, hey, cheer up. You have overcome the world. How? In Christ Jesus. He says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He says, I can do all things through Christ, which energizes me. So I'm not a weak man. I have an I can do mentality. How did I get it? By living from the inside, from my spirit. Tell somebody close to you, I know who I am. am. Say it again, I know who I am. Look at me. Look at me. I know who I am. I know who I am. Say, look at me. I know who I am. Say, watch out, devil. I know who I am. Praise God. Hallelujah. Something more. Oh, glory. Ah, glory! Look at this. Look at that 17th verse one more time. He says, But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Now that doesn't mean that we go to Mount Zion to receive deliverance. Mm-hmm. Now, that, that's the way many Christians have seen it. They go to Mount Zion to receive deliverance. I remember that old song they used to sing in that old church. Long, long ago. We are marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. I used to march with them as a little boy marching to Zion. But then I found out when you are born again, you are come to Mount Zion. Found out I was in Mount Zion already. When you're born again, you're born into Zion. So I stopped singing it. I said, I'm not marching to Zion no more because I'm already in Zion. I found out everybody who said he was marching to Zion was marching out of Zion. (laughs) Oh, boy. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just laugh a little bit. for the records just in case you know somebody's there who's been marching to Zion not knowing he's marching out of Zion I I want to show you something would you turn into the book of Hebrews can we just show it to them let's show it to them yep all right Hebrews the 12th chapter thank you Lord Jesus 
Livra da lagonski bra acte la gachestra diga. Glory to God. Ho, 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 ho. Amen. Look at verse 18 first. Read verse 18. Want to go? Again, again. Uh -huh, again, again. Ye are what? Now that's different from ye are not coming. You get it? He says, ye are not come. In other words, ye have not arrived in this place. He's going to tell us about it. Ye have not arrived. He says, hey, you're welcome. But guess what? Where you are now is not Mount Sinai. You're welcome. But you haven't come to Mount, Mount Sinai. Welcome. This is not, hey, you get it? Do you understand the point? You're welcome, but this is not Asurok. All right? But you're welcome. You have arrived. You have come from somewhere to somewhere. You are here now. Okay, let's read that line again. For what? Okay, go on. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Go to verse 22. <laughs> hey. Now it's too much. Listen, that, that verse, uh, uh, that whole passage is, is just too much. Let's read it. Let's read it. Look, look at it. He says, But ye are come, ye have arrived. Welcome, sir. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. Hey, he doesn't say ye are coming. He says ye are come. Ye have arrived. You're welcome. Ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. The heaven, that's the city Abraham was looking for. You remember that? Bible says Abraham was looking for a city. Which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He wasn't talking about a city somewhere in heaven. It's a spiritual city. It's woo glory. Uh, let's read it. Ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. <laughs> And to an innumerable company of angels. Last week we, we read something. We found out we were heavenly. You remember that? Yeah. Read that to you. In Philippians chapter, chapter 3 and verse 20. He says we are citizens of heaven. We're not going to be. We are. Alright now look at this. I want you to see all those who are in Zion with you. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly <laughs> and church of the firstborn, which are listed in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Spirits of righteous men made perfect. Those who, who, who died long, long ago. Before Jesus came. You remember he brought them out of Hades. And they joined in his train. And he took them to heaven. Praise God. Now they're there. They've been made perfect. Praise God. And to Jesus. See God the Father is in Zion. Jesus is in Zion. The angels are in Zion. Look at verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of evil. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Wow. You think about the commonwealth? This is it. <laughs> Amen. All right, now, we're trying to look at something in the book of Obadiah. Would you go back there? He says, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Now it's telling you, he doesn't mean that we go to Mount Zion to get deliverance. We are in Mount Zion already. And we are not asking for deliverance in Mount Zion. I'll show you. Look at verse 21. Read it. Want to go. Did you see that? Or did you miss that? See it again. And what? Did you see the word there? And what? Again. Again. Did you say a savior? No. One savior? No. Who? Savior. Saviors. There is deliverance in Mount Zion. Those who have not been delivered should come to Mount Zion. We are the saviors. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. The church gives deliverance to the world. Jesus said, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. How did he send him? In the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 38, the Bible says, How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now we're doing the same. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God forevermore. But you know, just because you read this doesn't mean it's going to work. How many of you know just because you read it doesn't mean it's going to work? All right. Turn to the book of Philippians. Have you ever heard somebody say, I know that I am healed, but I just can't understand why the pain is still there. <laughs> Come on, talk to me now. You ever seen that? I know I'm healed, but why is the pain still there? I've been suffering from malaria for so long, but I know that I'm healed. My trouble is, why wouldn't this thing just go away? Now you're all quiet. I got you. I want to read something to you. Philippians chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse number 12. Or would you read that to me? Verse 12, want to go. Did you see that? Say it again. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now look at it. He says, work out your own salvation. Isn't he talking to people who are born again? He's talking to the church. He's talking to God's children. Look at chapter 1 of the same book. Chapter 1. Let's see who he's talking to. Verse 1. Paul and Timothy... The servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. 
<laughs> the whole church with the bishops and deacons, saints of God. Now he tells them, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, godly reverence. Work out your own salvation. Salvation has been given to you. You are the called of Jesus Christ. You are the saved of Jesus Christ. Yes. But what are you going to do? This thing has to become real. He says, work out. He didn't say pray that God might work it out. He says, you work out your own salvation. Work out your salvation. When you get a gift that's been beautifully packaged, well wrapped, when you get the gift, a lot of times now, this is Christmas time and many of you are going to be getting gifts, all right? And they will come with Christmas wraps. Beautiful wrapping sheets. Now, isn't it nice when we take the gift and look at the wrapping sheet all around us and say, Wow! Wow! Glossy, shining, great! And then we keep the gift and we keep admiring this beautiful thing that's so beautifully wrapped. And we say, Wow! See what I got! See what I got! Wow! That's the way some Christians are. They got the gift, all right. But they're dancing around the rappers. The fellow who gave the gift to you doesn't have to come to you to unwrap the gift. You work out your salvation now. Tear that thing open. Get rid of the wraps. You'll be amazed. The thing inside is far better than the wrapping sheets. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. You see it? You think it's wonderful now. What if you open this thing? No, think about it. Just think about it. This salvation package that you got is wonderful. I mean, look at us when we sing, How great thou art. If we ever get to know how great he really is. You know that song, Wonderful Jehovah, Jehovah Wonderful. How many of you ever heard it? Great. It's coming from the Bible. Wonderful Jehovah. But the word wonderful actually means miracle working. So if the guy singing, wonderful Jehovah, knew what he was singing about, and realized he was talking about a miracle-working God, a supernatural God to whom nothing is impossible, if he actually knew beyond the song, his life would be different. Now we just read this. He said, work out your own salvation, not your uncle's salvation. Not your son's salvation. Not your wife's salvation. Not your husband's salvation. He says, work out your own salvation. Work it out now. Salvation is yours. But it's time to work it out. Hello. Hello. Work out your salvation. Tell somebody close to you, work out your salvation. Work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. Your own salvation. Your own salvation. Your own. Your own. I'm working out my own. I'm working out my own salvation. You work out your own salvation turn around tell somebody same thing say I'm working out my own salvation you work out your own salvation (laughs) 
Praise God. I said, praise God. All right, so how do you work out your own salvation? Beautiful process. How do you work it out? How many of you have been saved? You are saved. You are saved. Yes. Saved? Yes. From what? <laughs> yeah, what have you been saved from? What? You are saved from what? From sin? Uh huh. Inherited sins. Okay, I'm going to say one thing about that, all right? Great, it's good you mentioned it. Yep. From the kingdom of darkness. All right? From canality. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. So you have been saved from all these things, huh? Including the devil? <laughs> I feel sorry for you. <laughs> oh, glory. You know, <laughs> salvation is a beautiful word, a beautiful, all inclusive word. It's got to do with all that God does for the human person in making him to be the best that he could be haven't been the worst that he could be salvation but we have to understand salvation in different degrees for example, when you are born again, you are not saved from the devil. Did you hear me? Let me, let me show you this one more time. You know the church of Jesus Christ, it will take a long time to get this, but they will. Amen. I said they will. Praise God. Brother, come. Dickin, come. I'm looking for someone else. Where, okay, you come. You are in white too. Great. Yes, stay just right there. Thank you. I want to show you something. Y'all looking here? Now. I want you to understand salvation. Jesus came to die for the world. He did not come to die for Christians. He came to die for the world. The whole world. There were no Christians. Nobody could have been a Christian. It was impossible to be a Christian before Jesus died. He died for the world. The world of sinners. What about the righteous men in the Old Testament before Jesus died? Before he came and died? They were given righteousness as a promissory note. They did not enjoy righteousness. Righteousness was, in a sense, paid to their account. They couldn't spend it. You get it? I know if I talk in terms of money, you'll catch it quick. 
penalty, righteousness, was paid into their account, but they could not cash it for the time being. Why? It was post-dated. You getting it? Great. So, they had hope. They believed. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed. It was accounted to him for righteousness. But he couldn't spend it. So, when Abraham died, he went into Hades. Hades is the second part of hell where Abraham's bosom was. Sometimes it's used for all of hell, but it was divided into two parts. And he being the father of that covenant that will bring salvation, he was given a special place. And so every righteous man went to Abraham's bosom when he died. Where? In hell. But that place was not a place of suffering. The other side was the place of suffering. You remember that rich man and Lazarus? Jesus talked about? Great. Now, when Jesus came, all men were counted as sinners. Even those who were supposed to have been given righteousness couldn't enjoy the life of righteousness because it was post-dated. It was credited to their account, but they couldn't spend it. So, Jesus came, the first thing he did was to die for them. How? He took their place. The Bible says he became sin. Who knew no sin? He took upon himself all our guilt. Our sins were laid on Jesus. When our sins were laid on Jesus, he went to the cross for us. He died on that cross. When Jesus died on that cross, every man, every woman that was ever born into this world and that will ever be born into this world was on that cross that day when Jesus hung on the cross and died. We all died because he died for us. Then he was brought down from the cross. Now on that cross, Jesus died two deaths. The first death, if you study in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and you read verse 9, you'll find in the Old King James Version and many other versions, the word death is in plural, showing that he died two deaths. The first death occurred when he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, Lamas, Abaktanai. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Spiritual death is separation from God. And Jesus died spiritually. If he hadn't died first spiritually, he never would have died physically. So he died spiritually. Until he gave up the ghost. That was the second death. Now, Watch this, this is very important. When that happened to Jesus, every man in the world was free. Free from all sin. Are you still here? I want you to understand this. This is so important. Some of you are in LMC, all right? This is, this is good for you. You've got to catch this, all right? Those of you in Love World Ministerial College, catch this quick. When Jesus died on the cross, 
That was what saved everybody. He didn't need to be buried for man to be saved. When he died, he suffered that cruel death on that cross. First, the separation from God. Secondly, the physical death on that cross. Maybe you need to understand what that death was like. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, every sickness, every pain, every infirmity was laid on Jesus. If you study in the last few verses of the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, you'll understand what I'm talking about. The Bible says, as many were astonished at Jesus. The Bible says, his form was so murdered, more than the sons of men. He went completely out of shape. Jesus changed on the cross as they were looking at him. His body was completely squeezed up. And when you start in the New Testament, when they left there, they smote their breasts in shock at what they saw. Praise the Lord. So the death of Jesus, look at this. Here, I want you to take these two men as one man, all right? Great. This is one man. Jesus died for the man. Now he's saved. He's a saved man. He's a free man. Hallelujah. He's a free man. Jesus has died for him. Jesus has borne his sins away. So he's a free man. Now he can walk away as a free man. He's free from sin. But you know what? That would not have changed anything. Are you hearing me? He would have continued to sin again and, and again. And continued to ask for forgiveness. For forg forgiveness will be available. This is a sinner saved by grace. Are you hearing this? Yes. Sinner saved by grace. So he can go and sing and preach this gospel of the sinner saved by grace. He can go around saying, I am free. I am free. I am free from the devil. I am free from pain. I am free from sickness. I have been delivered. This man has been delivered. He can sing the song. The song of deliverance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But then the devil will come again. But then he will cry out, I've been delivered, I've been delivered. And probably the devil will go back, all right, all right, all right. He sings a song of deliverance. He is the redeemed of the Lord. Come on, are you hearing me? And so he can sing that song we used to sing. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say what? I am redeemed. He is the redeemed. But you know what? The church has not understood that he is not this man. Oh! As good as the songs are, as good as this deliverance is, as good as this wonderful, wonderful redemption that God is, he is not that man. The church is not this man who's been delivered. But this is the gospel that most of the church world knows. Why is it so? I'll tell you why. Let me give you a little illustration. Many years ago, when the late Archbishop Benson Idahosa was um, taken to court 
for contempt of court. I don't know how many of you knew about that case. But I was in that courtroom. Every session of the court, except the first day. And there were several sessions. Why was he taken there? Several things. But the main case now that had to do with the court contempt was this. The court issued an injunction restraining him from being made the Archbishop of Church of God Mission, the church uh, organization that he was heading. The court said he should not be made the Archbishop because some of the leaders were in disagreement with that and they sued him to court. Now listen. But he went ahead and was made the Archbishop. Now when this matter was called up in court, there was something very interesting from the side of the plaintiffs. The lawyer stood up and said some things. He said, bringing out the constitution of the, of the Church of God Mission International, he wanted the court to declare null and void the man's enthronement as the Archbishop. And one of his reasons was this, that according to the Constitution, before you can be made an Archbishop, you would first have been made a bishop. And that this man was never a bishop. Now hold on. He was smart. As far as the church constitution was concerned, he was right. He said, how could he have been made an archbishop without having been made a bishop according to this constitution? And they all began to look and grumble at it. Well, this is true. Uh, you know, they were looking at it. Examine the Constitution, all right. Until the defending lawyer stood up and explained, and they decided to go and look at the tapes. The man on the same day in the same position was made a bishop and an archbishop <laughs> and the constitution didn't say that was impossible that spoils that case are you still here what am i saying many christians are that way They've never understood that God could do so many things at the same time. They're dancing about their redemption and it's great, I'm telling you, it's great. After all, most Christians have celebrated that for years and they've enjoyed, I mean, they've enjoyed it. They, they've been living a wonderful life about this redemption that we got. But let me tell you something. When Jesus died, he was buried. You can go back to your seat. Thank you very much. The man was buried. Tell somebody he was buried. He was buried. I said he was buried. buried. Say it again. He was buried. He was buried. Yeah, he was buried. When he died, they took him down from the cross. They buried him in the grave. Then he went to hell. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He went to hell. The Bible says he threw off principalities. Why? Because they brought him to hell. 
He was a captive of Satan. Jesus. I'm talking about your Jesus. This Jesus you serve. He became a prisoner in the house of darkness. Satan got a hold of Jesus. And the devils took Jesus into the prison house of the damned. Why? Because he had become sin for us. Our sins were on him. He was a condemned man. We went free. Why that brother was going shouting, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. Jesus was in the prison house of darkness. They brought him there. And all the angels and everybody who got to hell had to bow to Satan. And he had wanted Jesus to do this thing long ago. Three years before this time. And Jesus refused to do it. He had said, bow down and worship me and I'll give you everything. And Jesus said, no, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. But now Jesus had become a prisoner of the devil. And they brought him in and they asked him to bow. But Jesus would not bow. And I said, and Rod, bow! Abraham looked across the gulf. He said, Isaac, come on here. That looks like our Redeemer. Because he was a prophet. And the Bible tells us he was waiting for the Redeemer. And Isaac looked. He said, yeah, Jacob. Come on! Here's the one we've been talking about. Jacob looked. <whistles> Judah! Joseph! Simeon! Naphtali! Reuben! He called everybody. He said, come look! And all the patriarchs came. And they looked. And the prophets joined. They saw Jesus define the first one in hell to defy the devil. And they all got on Jesus. As they grappled with Jesus, the Bible says, he threw off from himself principalities. He threw off powers. He put his foot on the devil's neck, rendered him helpless. Can you shout amen, somebody? He defeated the devil. The Bible says he took from the devil the keys of hell and death. And then went to Abraham's gates and opened the cells and let them all out. And took the captives in his train. And Jesus sent them into Jerusalem to look at the city that was promised them. This third day Jesus came out of the grave. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus came out. But when he came out, he had something to do for Israel. I want you to understand this. He had something to do for what? Israel. What was he going to do? Remember when he died, the veil was torn in two from the top to the bottom. You remember that? Yes. Great. Meaning that the way to the most holy place was open forever. And the mercy seat had been taken away. Now Jesus went to heaven. This was the first ascension because there were two ascensions of Jesus. The first ascension. Here he is in the garden. The garden where that tomb was, where he had been buried. And while he's getting ready for this first ascension, Mary comes out. Mary had been looking for her, looking for him. She had checked the grave, and Jesus wasn't in there. And then she was looking, 
She saw a man she thought was the gardener. And she said, Sir, where have you taken his body to? And she was looking around. And then the man said, Mary. And she turned. She recognized that voice. She said, Rabboni, wanting to go and greet him. And Jesus said, No, don't touch me yet. Why? He had become our high priest. Are you hearing me? Now he's doing this for Israel. He had become their high priest. He's taking the blood to the most holy place in heaven. Because the most holy place on earth had been cancelled. Are you hearing me? The ministry of the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood had been cancelled. That old high priest may have had the long hat or the long cap on his head, but he had been sacked. Are you hearing me? They condemned Jesus to death, but now he has sacked them. And, and he said, I've not yet ascended to my father, so don't touch me yet. Because when the high priest was going to the most holy place, which he did ever once in a year, nobody touched him. He said, but go to Galilee and tell, woo, go away. He didn't say, go tell my disciples. He said, go tell my brethren. I ascend to your father and my father. My God and your God. Hallelujah. And Mary went. Jesus went to heaven. And presented his blood on the mercy seat and the most holy place to wash Israel from the broken covenant oh boy because they broke God's covenant the Gentiles had no covenant they didn't break any covenant. The Bible says they were strangers to the covenant of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They had nothing to do with the Abrahamic covenant. So but now Jesus sets the Jew free. From the broken covenant. And his blood is accepted. His disciples are on earth. In a room in Galilee. Waiting for Jesus. Suddenly, the Bible says, while they were gathered together, the doors being shut, the windows being shut, then came Jesus in the midst of his disciples. They saw him. They felt him. Remember, eight days later, he came again. And this time, Thomas was there, who had been absent the first time. And he had said, I will not believe except I see him. And except I touch him, he said, I will not believe he's been raised from the dead. But Jesus heard him. When Jesus showed up, he said, Thomas, come. He said, put your finger into my hand. You know why? I want to tell you what Thomas wanted to see. Thomas saw that big Roman nail. As they drove it through the hands of Jesus. He knew that if those nails went through the master's hands. You are sure to find holes. Not just scars. He said except I see that. And put my finger into that hole. He said I will not believe. Because I saw that man crucified. I saw him die. He said I will not believe. Do you think Thomas was afraid to believe that God could raise Jesus from the dead? No, he knew about people being raised from the dead. Jesus raised the dead and the prophet raised the dead. But this one was very dead. <laughs> you get it? I mean, he saw when the Roman soldier thrust a spear through the side of Jesus. Blood and water came out, showing that his heart had ruptured. The man knew it. He said, there's no way for that man to live again. He's dead. He's finished. I believed he would rise. But when I saw that Roman soldier thrust that spear, I knew he would never come back. Jesus said, Thomas, 
put your finger into my hand. He pulled back his clothes a little. He said, dip your hand into my side. He looked through the hand of Jesus. The hole's right there. Put his trembling hand into the side of the master. Pretty ugly and rough. He said, my Lord and my God. <laughs> Jesus said, because you have seen, you believe. But blessed are those. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Who have not seen, but yet have believed. <laughs> but here's something wonderful. When Jesus died and went to heaven, you know, this time, something I want to show you. Why did he tell Thomas to touch him? And he had asked Mary not to touch him. Somebody said, because Mary was a woman. <laughs> no. No, he had come back. That's why the first words he uttered when he came into that room, he said, all hail. You don't hail until you're victorious. He said, all hail. Something wonderful. Something wonderful that we get from the resurrection of Jesus. Now, he was crowned while he was in heaven. The head. Oh, thank you, Lord. The head. I feel that anointed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He was crowned the head of the new race. He was now being sent as the second Adam. The Bible says the second Adam is the Lord from heaven. Are you hearing this? He came from the grave with the resurrection life. A new kind of life. And so in heaven he was anointed. Not the Christ of salvation to bring them into salvation, but the Christ that heads up salvation of the victors. Hear this, maybe you don't understand it, because at this time, remember the first time, the first time he came in as the Christ, Messiah. But now he's anointed. He's anointed. He's anointed in the midst of his brethren. Watch this, because he sent all of those witnesses. Oh boy. Do you remember them? He brought them out of Hades. All right. He sent them to heaven. When, when they got to heaven, they couldn't enter. They had to wait for Jesus. Until Jesus showed up. They were waiting. The gates were locked. You can go read, read all of this in Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. You get a piece of this. The gates were locked. And when Jesus showed up, he said, lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be ye lifted up and the king of glory shall come in. And the angel behind the door said, who is the king of glory? You know why they didn't recognize him? I feel like doing a somersault. I said, you know why they didn't recognize him? My, because he had become a new creation. Hear me, hear me. You know, the first time he came, he was born of the woman. When God raised him up and gave him a new kind of life, when he came out, he said, This day have I begotten you. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten you. That's the day Jesus was born again. He was the first to be born again. When God raised him from the dead, he was the first to be born again. So when he got to the heavenly gates, he said, lift up your heads, all your gates, and the king of glory shall come in. I heard somebody say one time, no, that was the gate of hell when Jesus was coming out. After defeating the devil, I said, no, the word of God doesn't say, and the king of glory shall go out. He says, and the king of glory shall come in. 
and he said, lift up your heads, O ye everlasting doors. Now the doors of hell cannot be called everlasting doors. For the Bible says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. In the book of Revelation. He said, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. He said, who is the king of glory? He said, the Lord, strong and mighty, mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. And they opened the doors for Jesus. And he went in with the saints of God. And before his brethren, he was anointed. Are you hearing me? I said he was anointed. He was anointed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, he gives that life to all who believe in him. When he died on that cross, we died in him. When he was buried, we were buried in him. When God raised him up from the dead, we were raised up together with him. Are you hearing me? When he received eternal life as the newborn, we also became the born again along together with Jesus. Now, the Bible says, we are seated, oh boy. We are seated together. Brothers and sisters, these are not theories. These are revelations of reality. Are you hearing me? This is the fact of life. The new creation is not the man that was saved from the devil. The man that was saved from the devil was buried in the grave. Are you hearing me? When God raised us up, we were raised together as a new creation, a new species. We don't have an old life. The old man died. The old man was crucified with Christ. Are you hearing me? Now you have a new life. And you are superior to Satan. The new creation is superior to the devil. The new creation has overcome the world. The new creation is not of this world. I said, hear me, you cannot be poor anymore. There is a reason, it is too late. I said, you cannot be poor anymore. Your name is on every house. Your name is on every car. Your name is on every airplane. Your name is on everything in this world. I know who I am. Hallelujah. He has brought us into a large place. The lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. How in the world could I be poor? How? How? We are joint heirs with Christ. Not co-heirs, but joint heirs. That means everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to me. In the same way that it belongs to him. And we are not sharing it 50-50 or 90-10 or 70-30 or 60-40. It's 100% together and 100% together. Come on, shout amen, somebody. Woo, glory! Hallelujah. So this is a new man in Christ. His songs are different. He doesn't sing songs like I'm redeemed from the devil. He doesn't sing songs like, uh... I'm saved from sin. This is a new creation. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 tells him, Sin shall not have dominion over you. The new creation, the Bible says, cannot sin, for his seed remains in him. So why does he sin then? Because he's a baby. He said, ye are yet carnal. As long as you're acting like an ordinary man, you are still carnal. The Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually deserved. He said, but the spiritual man. 
understandeth all things, yet he himself is understood of no man. Why don't they understand him? I'll tell you, because it says you are peculiar. There's something different about you. You are the only one who can shout, I got the whole world when your pockets seem to be empty. Because you walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. No wonder Paul tells us, we walk by faith, not by sensory perception. We walk by faith. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of unseen realities. Are you hearing this? It is the evidence, the proof of unseen realities. You may say, I got the headaches, but I tell you something, I can't have headaches. What if you feel something on your head? You're looking at the wrong thing. I said, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at the wrong thing. How can I say I'm rich when I know I'm really poor? You see you? You see what you really believe? You really believe in what you see with the optical eyes, yet you say you walk by faith. How can you say you really have no money? How can you say you really are broke? How could you be broke if you're the king's kid? Hear me? Hear me? Brothers and sisters, when you begin to live from the inside, are you hearing this? When you begin to live from the inside and to work according to what you know on the inside, he says, as we look at the glory of God, we are metamorphosed, we are changed, we are transfigured into the image that we see in the mirror. Suddenly, the forces of life will be revealed and released through your spirits. These powerful forces of our kingdom working within you will begin to pull to you all men, all the forms, all the circumstances, and all the materials that are consistent with your new nature in Christ Jesus. in me. I said the word of God is working in me. The word of God is working in me. Thank you. The word of God is working in me. Dominion over circumstances. Dominion over the world. Dominion over the devil. As you proclaim it, it will come to pass. I said as you proclaim it, it will come to pass. As you proclaim it, it will come to pass. Your salvation is in your mouth. Are you hearing me? Your prosperity is in your mouth. Are you hearing me? All the funds you require are in your mouth. That baby is in your mouth. Can you shout amen, somebody? Jesus. Ye are of God, little children, and I've overcome them, because greater is he that is in you. 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 Greater, 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 greater. Somebody shout it. He has made me a deliverer. Are you hearing me? I know who I am. I got divine health in my body. As he is, so are we in this world. Oh, glory. Give him praise.